And so for those of you who become downhearted about the Kashmir issue, um, at least one publisher <laughs> wants to keep my book in print um, all the time. And um, one has to at least give credit for that because it's not easy. It's not fighting, easy fighting for space in terms of publications. Um, I remember on one trip I'd come back from the Valley of Kashmir and I was full of wanting to write an article and have it published. And I rang all the editors I knew and they said, no, 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 we're busy on Iraq this week. We don't want this, we don't want that. So please don't feel downhearted that the international community doesn't care. Um, uh, as I say, I care, and um, a lot of other people do care, but it's sometimes you're fighting for space. And I think our challenge is really to keep the focus on the Kashmir issue so that it doesn't drop really from the agenda of topics that need to be covered. And I think particularly in the post, what I call post-2019 era, that's very important because um, the situation has changed dramatically was already dramatic, but it's changed even more dramatically since that time. Just for those of you who, who don't know me and might wonder why I'm, I've got a book that's been in publication since 1996, um, I first went to the Valley of Kashmir, to your homeland, for those of you who are from, from Srinagar, um, in 1981, way before you were all born. A lot of people went, we're going to talk about the old and the young in this room, uh, were born. And it was one of the most beautiful places I had seen. I'd met a young Kashmiri in London. And uh, being um, endowed with the characteristics of, of his culture, he'd said, you must come to Kashmir, you must come to my home, you must stay in my home, you must you know, treat my home as your home. I have done that ever since 1981. And again, I think this is something when we're talking about uh, cross cultures, it's really important to remember. Sadly, that gentleman just died um, a few days ago, but uh, I remained in touch with him and his family since 1981. It was because of that and my own uh, work as a journalist, and I was working for the BBC at the time, uh, when uh, the situation deteriorated so dramatically as it did in 1987 following the elections, and then 1989, 1990, that's when I determined that I wanted to write my first book, Kashmir in the Crossfire. I chose the title Kashmir in the Crossfire because to me, Kashmir was in the crossfire. It was in the crossfire of conflicting rhetoric, conflicting opinions and uh, between India and Pakistan. And what I wanted to do and what I chose to do was to write a book uh, that brought together all the differing aspirations and voices that I was listening to and that I was hearing because what the Kashmir issue had been reduced to um, prior, really, to the 1990s was almost a topic that was discussed in India um, and discussed in Pakistan. It was the indo pakistan even in the United Nations, it was called the India-Pakistan question. And um, as a journalist who is interested in primary research and grassroots, I wanted to find out where the voice of the people were in this, and which people, who are the people uh, living in Jammu and Kashmir, as the state is officially called, the former princely state, as we know, um, of Jammu and Kashmir. And that was my inspiration. And uh, when I went to approach a publisher and I said I wanted to work on Kashmir, he said, oh, I don't want to work on Kashmir. It'll never be resolved. And I said, no, 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 it's a really important issue. It must have a proper focus and proper literature. And I think it was early days, and again, now there are many Kashmiri writers who have written, Bashar Apia, um, Mirza Wahid. But at that stage, there wasn't so much coming out um, by Kashmiris themselves. And that was, as I say, my objective was, with all the difficulties, and um, you, know, you're, you're, you are an institute that's looking in, into conflict resolution, was, it was trying to resolve the conflict of what were these conflicting viewpoints and where was there any meeting point? Because this was what became very evident and very obvious in my early research, was who were the Kashmiris? What, where, what, what voice should be listened to? And of course, we, we are, um, as writers and journalists, we do look for sound bites, we do look for shorthand. And even as I have done, I've looked for shorthand with the title of the book, Kashmir in Conflict. But as I've just mentioned, we're talking about Jammu and Kashmir politically. And if you refer to any of the material in the United Nations or any of the documentation, it is the resolution 
of the Jammu and Kashmir dispute. That is the way forward, is what we've got to look for. How do we resolve the Jammu and Kashmir dispute? Obviously, in recent times, we talk about Kashmir, we talk about Kashmiri's right of self-determination. Uh, but what do we mean by the Kashmiri's right of self-determination? Because if we're looking for resolution, we're looking for people's opinions other than the inhabitants of the Valley of Kashmir. Could we possibly have our map up? Is that too much to ask? Because it would be nice to have it. Thank you very much. Here we are with the map of Jammu and Kashmir. And what, as I say, we, we talk about the, the self-determination of, of Kashmir and the main area of, let's say, disaffection, unhappiness, discontent has been in the Valley of Kashmir. But if you look at that, we don't quite have the topographical map that would show us. The Valley of Kashmir in that large region is 80 to 85 miles long, 20 to 25 miles wide. It is a very fractional, territorially small proportion of that large state. It's, for those of you who are familiar with London, I'm afraid I can't quite do the, the same distance in, in Pakistan, but it's the distance between London and York, um, which is not a very great distance. In the other areas, as we see, we have Gilgit Baltistan. Um, these these uh, inhabitants would not really call themselves Kashmiris. They are Gilgit, you know, they're from Gilgit, they're from Baltistan, they're from the Hunza area. They're not, p politically, they're part of the state of Jammu and Kashmir, but they're culturally not Kashmiris. But if we're looking to resolution, their, their opinion, their rights, their aspirations also have to be considered. Then you have Ladakh, the other large area. Uh, these, these inhabitants, they're mainly of Buddhist faith. There are some Muslim Shias. Again, they're not culturally Kashmiris, although they belong to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. As we see, we have Azad Kashmir. In fact, the proper title is Azad Jammu and Kashmir, free Jammu and Kashmir, that area which, um, after the 1947-49 war, um, was set up as a, as a government uh, in exile, effectively, um, because it was an area that was um, prized away from the state under Indian control. And then you have Jammu and Kashmir down below. The, Jammu, the valley, as I said, the Valley of Kashmir, which is the heart of, the, of where the Kashmiris live, um, is just, just really where you can see the Jammu region, and then of course, uh, Jammu word, and then of course Jammu is to the south. That is populated by, again, non-Kashmiri speakers um, who would, would more possibly call themselves Kashmiri politically, um, but they don't necessarily speak Kashmiri language. And this is where the difficulty and the dilemma lies. And I have to stress this point because when you're talking to uh, the international community, or you're talking to anyone who's not really very familiar with the Kashmir issue, it's, it's confusing. Because who are the Kashmiris? Who is the voice? If you're looking for resolution, because this entire state is inhabited by people, all of whom have an equal right to say what they would like for their future. And we all know about the plebiscite that was promised by Jawaharlal Nehru and by Qaidi Azam, it was agreed um, in 1947 that a plebiscite would be held. It was endorsed by the United Nations. The United Nations was meant to um, facilitate the holding of the plebiscite. Uh, and every inhabitant of that state was to have the right to decide what their future would be. And uh, as I say, this has been the stumbling block. And so we resort back to talking about the Kashmiri's right of self-determination. And because this hasn't been resolved, we have had tremendous militarization, particularly of the Valley of Kashmir. There is also militarization in the dark. The bulk of the Indian army is actually sitting in the dark. I've seen their, their contunements uh, when I've traveled there.
But the militarization in the Valley of Kashmir, and those of you who come from the Valley of Kashmir, is unbearable. And I say this with feeling as someone who is very privileged and lives in the West. But having been there, I actually went there, quotes, on holiday with my children at a fairly calm time in 2005. They were all teenagers at the time. And um, they were Western teenagers, and they said, Mommy, why are there so many soldiers on the streets? There's one every corner. There's one on every block. And you cannot underestimate living in a society, as those of you from the Valley of Kashmir know, where you have soldiers who look alien. They look a little bit like the American soldiers looked on Chicken Street in Kabul with their great big helmets and their great big jack boots and their Kalashnikov guns or whatever guns they use with all the barbed wire, with all the sandbags. How do young people feel growing up in conflict? And we can talk about the statistics of those who have died, over 100,000, we understand. Those who have been left as half widows because they don't actually know and haven't had confirmation that their husbands have died or that their sons have died, the, the mothers who haven't really been able to mourn. We can talk about the orphan children. But Every single citizen who remains is growing up in conflict, in trauma, in stress. And nowadays, again, we're all talking about meditation and all the sort of things we should do to remove stress from our lives. So I think this is where the human issue of Jammu and Kashmir has to attract our attention. And I urge you all, in terms of the narrative, is this is not a piece of real estate. It is a piece of land on which human beings live. And I think, to me, as a, as a, as a writer, as a journalist, as a historian, um, this is what has kept me attached to the issue um, for five editions of my book. And if there has to be a sixth, there'll have to be a sixth. Uh, because it's a humanitarian issue. And um, as I say, it's a humanitarian issue competing with other humanitarian issues in the world. The world is not perfect. It's not free from humanitarian issues. But just because there are other issues, it doesn't mean that this issue shouldn't be up there with them. And I think particularly since August 2019, it's, it's, it's risen in, in terms of urgency. Uh, not that it wasn't urgent before, and would that it had been resolved before. You can look at, you know, those of you who are scholars of the subject and scholars of conflict resolution, you can look and examine at the various talks that were held about talks, there have been talks going on indefinitely, and try and determine what, what went wrong, what is the stumbling block that India, Pakistan, with a representative selection of the inhabitants of the state, can't sit down at the negotiating table and work out what would benefit the future of all our peoples. Because this is the other thing that I stress. While this issue is unresolved, you have this hostile relationship between Pakistan and India, which you can't change your neighbors. They will always be neighbors. You cannot change geography. And not to be able to get on with your neighbor, not to have more than one crossing point Waga between Lahore and Amritsar that you can cross. Look at the terrible hatred between France and Germany after the first, Second World War, First World War and Second World War. Yet somehow they managed, and they had territory they were disputing, that now you drive past, you wave your passport, you don't know which, which country you're going into. They still have retained their sovereignty. It's nothing to do with relinquishing sovereignty between India and Pakistan. But while that relationship is on hold, primarily because of the Jammu and Kashmir issue, I know that people like to say, oh, it's just one issue, We'd, we would um, not be friends even if we didn't have the Jammu and Kashmir issue. I don't agree with that. I believe that you, there would be far more potential to have a, a, an improved relationship if this issue had been resolved. And while it's not resolved, a whole another generation, you young men over there, have grown up I don't believe you were born in 1990. 1999. There you are. You see? Um, and the same. Uh, you have grown up in conflict. 
you, you should not have to be dealing with this issue. And this is what I found. I found this in the UK when I've addressed seminars, that all, all the young people I'm addressing um, and I'm looking, I'm looking at, they were not born when I first went to the Valley of Kashmir, when I first started working on the issue. Why should they be having to pick up the pieces and, and deal with this issue? And so I think my, my message is, is what's very important is to create the narrative which is credible, authentic, and can be transmitted to others. I think it's very true to say that those young, young men who took up arms in the 1990s, and I interviewed a number of them because I went back into the Valley of Kashmir during the early 1990s to do a lot of interviews. They took up the gun, and this is what they said to me, because we wanted the international community to understand we had a just cause. They never thought they would win against the Indian army. You can't win against a professional army when you, you're, you know, uh, as I say, um, inexperienced. Um, it, they, it was not an army. But they wanted to highlight the just cause to the international community. And so if we're looking for the way forward, difficult as it is, it is, to my mind, only going to be possible with some assistance from the international community. And the international community will only assist if it really understands the importance, the urgency, and the humanitarian aspect. Now, whether we talk about, again, it's a loose term, the international community, who in the international community? The United Nations, the um, EU, the, an individual country, the United States, who could it be? To my mind, you need a facilitator who doesn't have any agenda, doesn't have any vested interest, but who would act in a way as a lawyer does when you're having a divorcing couple. It's very unusual, especially I mean, in our societies, I know, to, to have a, a divorce where you don't have to call in a lawyer, because it's a very sensitive thing. You need somebody as a scapegoat, somebody to blame and say, well, I didn't want to do this, but because of the lawyers, you know, I've done this. Um, and this is where I revert to another point that um, I've made before in terms of this international mediation. As we know, the Indian government is persistently saying, we agreed in 1972 at Simla it was to be a bilateral issue. And this has been, it's kind of like a barrier that's put up. And again, I've talked to a number of, um, you know, my own um, members of parliament and, and influential individuals, and they say, no, 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 we can't do anything because India and, you know, India and Pakistan agreed it would be a bilateral issue. Uh, I would beg you all to read the small print of the similar agreement, easily available online. Um, they, the similar agreement, not in relation to Kashmir in particular, but just in general to all outstanding disputes, the, the, the wording is that we, we will attempt to resolve our outstanding issues bilaterally or by any other means mutually agreed upon. And this vital phrase has to be made in bold because they have failed to, uh, to um, resolve it bilaterally. Therefore, there's no reason why they shouldn't use or any other means possible, which could be an international facilitator. The United Kingdom, as you well know, had 38 years of military occupation of um, Northern Ireland. And they were not ashamed to bring in the United States, um, which for that particular dispute was a useful mediator and facilitator. There is no shame. As I say, there's, you wouldn't think twice about bringing in a lawyer in a divorce. So there's no shame in bringing in another country. It's true to say it must be a facilitator who has no agenda, even if it's one individual who has no um, agenda, along with a representative selection of all the peoples of the state. Because it can't be a solution which is imposed. I do remember that uh, when I interviewed Shabir Shah before he went, was arrested um, some time ago, he said Shimla failed and would never have succeeded, in fact, because it did, it did not include the views of the sons of the soil. So it's, it's complex, but it's not impossible. And 
as I say, I think from the most important aspect is to bear in mind that while we sit comfortably in this very nice room, while prime ministers and presidents sit very nicely and comfortably in their, their homes, um, people are suffering. The young people are suffering. And as I say, I saw it myself even before August 2019 when I was in Srinagar in the summer of 2019, the, the trauma of the young students. Can they go to school? Can they not go to school? The effects of lockdown, the effects of um, having cordon and search operations. As I say, we're so worried about minor stresses in our lives. These are big stresses. In addition to which, entire South Asia is actually suffering, not as much as in, in Jammu and Kashmir, but you, you all are being deprived of the resources which are being spent on military defense, both countries, that should be spent on poverty eradication, development, education. Uh, both, of, both countries are sitting on demographic time bombs. When West Pakistan was census in 1951, there were 35 million people there. There are now 210 million people on the same land space. Um, India, as we know, has grown exponentially, over a billion people. Water is, there is a water shortage. So it is critical that we don't wait any longer. As I say, humanitarian for the inhabitants of the state, but also for the entire region. And we don't have to dwell on recent events with what's going on in, in the Ukraine with Russia. But to have this state of semi-instability between India and Pakistan when there are so many other problems in the world uh, is enough is enough. Before I conclude, I just do want to point out um, on the map I've talked about the various regions. We have China sitting there. And as you know, China has been a staunch ally of Pakistan. If we are going to talk about resolution and the way forward, we also have to consider China, because China is occupying Aksai Chin and what's called the Trans-Karakoram Tract, or the Chakskam Valley. Uh, this is not a dormant issue. And as we saw just recently with the uh, fighting um, between the line, the, the line which divides is called the line of actual control, there was fighting between India and China. So it's, it is an international issue that needs resolution, and it needs all stakeholders to be involved. The reason China has not been so emphasized is because it is, this area is obviously, as you can see from its um, uh, location, is uninhabitable. But nonetheless, when the government of India produces a map, as it did in October 2019, indicating Ladakh um, and the Indian frontiers, including all of Ladakh, um, which they joined together somehow with Gilgit Baltistan and uh, Jammu and Kashmir, which they joined together with as a Jammu and Kashmir. And school children in India learn that this is the map and this is an integral part of India. Um, we have a certain distance to go to get the correct sort of map um, in all school books and all textbooks. And as we know, maps are impossible um, because nobody will agree to, to the maps. But I just leave that as, as a thought for you all, that if we're going to move to Kashmir the way forward, we're moving to Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir, the resolution, we have to consider that huge state which um, is up there on the map. We can't just talk about one specific region. Now, I really welcome your questions. I hope I haven't spoken for too long. Thank you. <coughs>